on Rotten Tomatoes, didn't it? That was very good. Yeah, in, yeah. The, in the States, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I yeah. think it's generally liked here from what I get from I gather. Yeah. It seems like, yeah, it seems like they're, it, it's good. Yeah. Well, your job's safe for another year or two. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You think I'd get my next gig? Yeah. Troubleshooter, that's, uh, that is going ahead, is it? Or is uh, that... n actually, that's a movie I wrote that yeah. I may... may do. It's, it's on IMDb as in production, but right. that's wrongly stated. Okay, right. I may, I may make that in the next few years. Oh, okay. Okay, so cool. I think it... All right, let me take a quick... Uh, sure. ...step here. All right. Bum, bum, bum. Excellent. Curly Billy. Um, young Larry Levin come up with the story you co-scripted, and I'm just wondering when it came to the actual shoot, given that you've got Paul Rudd and Jason Segel, whether there's a certain degree of, let's just put the camera on, lads, and this is the moment, and you just say what you want to say, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I wish it was that simple, but uh, no, I mean, it definitely the, the movie is a combination of, of scripted and improvisation. You know, but it's not just, we don't just sort of go, all right, guys, go. You know, I mean, we definitely have directions we want to go in or you know we're kind of all collaborating to come up with the best thing but, but they're amazing improvisers well there is Judd, Judd Apatow swears by the idea of just shooting uh, hours and hours of footage and in the editing room he'll sort out what what needs to go into the movie mm -hmm. itself and I don't know if that's a, an approach that you would have taken or whether you were kind of a bit more economical and said we just need to get this scene this way and get yeah out of here. I think the studio wishes I was more economical but I <laughs> yeah. we shot a lot of film on this movie yeah I mean just we tried a lot of different things and went in different directions and I think we actually set a record for amount of film shot in the sh in the fewest amount of days uh, which I can't say I'm proud of but but we we did it Kodak was really happy with me well they came down to Apatow and knocked up and gave an award I think at one point because of the, he, he used. I don't know, 100 hours or some, uh, yeah. you know, so yeah. you're in good company. Good. <laughs> this is, a, this is I think you could call this a, like a fine bromance, this idea that now men, the idea of men sort of dating in the same way that a man and a woman would date and just to be friends and hang out together. And, and the comedy here really, I guess, I'm guessing from a shooting point of view, rather than being shooting it like a buddy buddy flake, you kind of had to take the romantic comedy notion yeah. and turn it on its head a little bit. And what, I don't know whether that was kind of, in a way, it almost writes itself because there's so many traditions that we expect in a romantic comedy that once you put two guys in that role, it's just very, very rich for, for you know, all the awkwardness that normally comes with, with the, those awkward dates and phone calls and whether I should get back in touch. Exactly, yeah, I mean, there's certain benchmarks of romantic comedies, and, you know, I wasn't trying to do a parody, but it's just like there are certain things you're going to hit. The first phone call, or the meet cute, which is always a staple of romantic comedy. How do, how do the two people meet this the way they meet at an open house, and the should I call him or not, you know, and it, you just apply it to two guys, and it did kind of lay itself out. Um, I mean, then there's, you know, we want to take you on different, on a different tour and, and, and kind of surprise the audience and there's some things that happen in the second half of the movie that, you know, some twists and turns. But, but for sure we had this kind of romantic comedy structure of things to try to hit. It's been a hit already in the States and, and it's obviously going to be a hit here and generally very positive reviews, 80% on Rotten Tomatoes in the States and I think the reviews over here have been very good and the one thing that someone like the New York Times would mention the fact that because we're in that sort of it's his time, like there, there's a sense that Judd Apatow's DNA is sort of all over this movie even though he isn't. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's something you're, you're kind of comfortable with or whether you feel well that's just lazy kind of journalism kind of just because he's the guy who happens to be heading up a lot of these movies with these particular actors yeah. and he's uh, supposedly you, an influence. You know I, I think well Judd and I are friends and he's we've worked together and he's a great filmmaker so I, I'm always happy to you know be compared or in this or people say it's like his movies because I like his movies um, but I do think that if you watch I Love You Man closely and, and you watch Knocked Up and Super Bad and you know 40 Year Old Virgin they're, they're just different I mean they use similar actors and they're like cousins I think you know they're, they're of course they're in the same comedy universe but I just think the tone of I Love You Man is kind of its own thing. So I totally understand why people bring up Judd's name and, and quite frankly, I'm flattered by it. But I do think they're, they're, they're their own kind of tones. Well, you, you came first to notice for a lot of people with Safe Men in 98 and then a big hit with Along Came Polly in 2004. And I don't know whether the success of something like this, you feel you've moved up the Hollywood food chain a little bit or whether it's just you're too busy working to notice how, how is my career going out there somewhere. Yeah, usually you're just working all the time. I mean, I'm already writing a new movie and, and you know, getting ready to, to write a second movie after that. So it's not, you know, I don't, I'm really more gratified that this movie's been received well in the States and, and hopefully will internationally. And, you know, and it, it's more like that. You know, I don't think, I'm not so conscious of, oh, here where I am, on, here's where I am on, am on the, uh, see, I can't even speak. I shouldn't be in Hollywood. 
<laughs> I'm like way down on the food chain. You've still got a soul, it's not right. <laughs> yeah. We mentioned before the cameras rolled, the always unreliable IMDb have you down for the Troubleshooter, a movie you've written that they say you're doing next, but you've said to me now that it might be a few years. So yeah. I don't know whether, again, maybe you're too busy to have actually sort of settled on what you're going to do next, whether you're going to wait for this to all settle down and then make a decision or? Well, I'm actually very busy writing a movie called The Little Fockers, which is a third in the Meet the Parents franchise. Um, so I'm writing that right now, and I think we'll start making that this summer. And then there's an original script that I'm working on to hopefully shoot sometime next spring, you know, with a, hopefully some of the cast members uh, for My Love You Man. I was going to say with, uh, with Little Fockers that, that the fact that the third is very rarely the charm, that in most movies kind yeah. of really dip on the third, and, and I'm wondering whether that's sort of like a real concern because, you know, it's great little characters and obviously it's almost inevitable that they would go to the kids after they've done sure. both sets of parents. But is it, is it something that you kind of feel, because it's got a huge expectation box office-wise and all that, yeah. does that put an odd pressure on just trying to enjoy writing gags? Do you feel like we've really got to deliver commercially here. Yeah, I you know what well I feel that way every time I work on a movie. I want it to be original and good and you know movies take so much energy and time that you want it to be good. But this one for sure, we want to we're very conscious that if we don't just want to cash in on the third one and and go, "Ah, here it is." We we want to make it fresh and original and and really good. And we the the cool thing about these movies is that you have a shorthand because the audience now has grown to know these characters over the last 10 years. So you can kind of check in with them every sort of five years and see how they're doing. And um, that's what we're trying to do, you know, take you on a on a new journey with these folks. I should mention a few uh, curious things about, uh, about yourself. That, that I know you're cousin to Doug Lyman. Yeah. How bonkers is he exactly? Because I always find his <laughs> movies are amazing, but he just strikes me as a guy who's so out there. Like he's so <laughs> kind of hyperly, I think in another world, maybe just he's constantly making a film in his head, but... Yeah, is he actually uh, stable in real Doug life? Doug is or? is one of the sweetest guys you'll ever meet. Um, he's he's kind of like a, a mad professor. You know, he just is in his own universe. But he is uh, you never met a nicer guy or more family oriented kind of guy. He just I think because he's always you know got got something internally going on. People think that uh, you know he's a bit of a mystery. But that, I don't know if that was part of the influence for you because you, 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 went, you went and studied, uh, I think you majored in history because uh, it was the, the, the least uh, amount of requirements <laughs> necessary. Right. And then you went into sort of script writing class thing or, or playwriting class because uh, you kind of always had an interest in movies. But I'm wondering what was the kind of in the decision really to go this route completely? I don't know whether yeah. Doug influenced you or whether it was... Not really. I mean, Doug always wanted to be a director. And so I, I obviously, you know, had some you know, like an older cousin that, that was going down that path. But for me, it was as simple as when I was 16, my parents gave me a video camera. And I always did comedy writing, but suddenly I had this outlet to make short movies. And from the age of 16, I wanted to do nothing else but write and direct comedies. But I know that your, your mom was a, a Joan, and maybe still is, like a New York radio kind of yeah. host. And, and, uh, and, and just, just that sort of background I know were you kind of did you have contacts that was this a, like a long slow has it been a long hard struggle for you to get to this point where you could actually make movies or whether I don't know whether it all happened it's you know it's it's definitely I had a good path I mean my, my mother is a radio broadcaster but you know they didn't I didn't have a lot of connections to the movie business basically I I got lucky you know I made a short film that was at the Sundance Film Festival and some people saw it and I got a chance to make my first independent film, Safe Men, which was a cult movie. It's not a big hit, but a lot of people in the movie industry saw it and, and asked me to write movies for them. And, you know, that kind of jump-started my career. And then and Ben Stiller had seen Safe Men. And that was sort of him seeing that movie and wanting to work with me was a turning point in my life. And we made, we've made five or seven movies together. You know, we started with Meet the Parents and Zoolander and, you know, Along Cape Polly, Meet the Fockers. So, you know, he, we've done a lot of stuff together. Rock and roll. I haven't given the friendly finger. Nice <laughs> to talk to you, son. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Cheers. All right. Well